Okay. Well, it's been great to be with you again. So, yes, good morning if you're in the uh, the Americas or uh, wherever else you are. Good afternoon, evening. Um, great to be with you again. Um, hoping that some of you managed to see the, the session last week. But if not, no fear. I'll tell you where you can find it again. Um, I was going to say, did you enjoy NAB? Um, this is what it would have looked like if we'd been there in Vegas. This this is the 3D model if we'd been there this week. Um, so, uh yeah, unfortunately we weren't, we, but that does mean we've saved a bit of uh, aircraft fuel, I guess. And also, um, I've saved putting on too much weight from eating too much whilst I'm there. So I, I think overall I've probably benefited, even though it's frustrating not being able to meet and greet everyone face to face like we normally do. Just a little note about where I'm coming from. Uh, those of you that joined last week will have seen this, but on that where that red arrow is pointing on the in the UK, just the, the southeast coast. I'm a, literally about a mile from the from the sea in, a, in this town called Felixstowe um, on the edge there. And that's where I'm uh, speaking to you from. And this is a picture I took yesterday afternoon in, in our front garden, just so you can see that we've got some nice weather here. So I don't know what the weather's like where you are, but we're having some beautiful sunshine here at the moment. So it's not too bad being at home and working from here at the moment. So, yeah, very nice to be with you. A few notices. We always have to have some notices. First of all, um, I think Cosimo's mentioned it already, but the, um, the webinar from last week that I did, which I'll be referencing at a few points throughout the uh, um, event, is actually on our YouTube channel. So it's just nevion.com slash YouTube and you will get that. Um, I'm doing another webinar in two weeks time uh, on the Friday, same times as today, um, called Don't Forget the Audio. So um, hope you can join us for that. And I know many of you have been actually meeting up with our sales and um, architects teams. Um, if you haven't actually managed to have a meeting and you would like to meet up, then we would love to speak with you. So do go through your normal sales channel or if you can't get hold of them for any crazy reason, do feel free to email me. That's great. OK, so time for a little bit of humour before we get into the um, into the seminar proper. I saw this on LinkedIn the other day and I've nicked it. So um, it's, it's, a, it's an amusing it's an amusing little slide. And I think the, 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 the interesting thing for me as a technologist is that actually the level of innovation that broadcasters have been doing globally in the last six weeks to actually be able to keep on air and for presenters to be able to work from home and and even people controlling vision mixers, sound desks, graphics engines, um, all of this stuff um, from home it is absolutely amazing. I've been loving watching some of the videos that have been put on LinkedIn by various organizations about how they've been doing true at home virtual production. So, yes, an interesting um, just a little uh, amusing anecdote on the, the state of uh, what we're doing at the moment as a broadcast community driven by this horrible um, world global pandemic. Anyway, moving on from that, that's the last time I'm going to mention it. Um, as you are probably well aware, Nevion is really passionate about standards. It's, it's kind of in our ecosystem. It's part of our DNA. Um, so um, it's everything, everything that we love. So I'll just keep on there. The, um, the five the five standards bodies on there are all standards bodies we're very involved in, um, right from the inception and evolution of standards right through to implementing them, testing them, and 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 being involved in promoting them. So, uh, absolutely part of our DNA, and you know everything that we're working towards is open, and the idea is that people um, can interoperate, and uh, that's again that's just what we what we love to do. You're probably very aware of our the two main like linchpins, if you like, of our portfolio uh, in, in the solutions we offer. One is um, Video iPath, which is our software um, defined management and orchestration system, um, uh, which is unparalleled scale. I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit as we go through to illustrate a couple of points as we go through the webinar. And Virtuoso, our software defined media node, I think we've got almost 30 different software images that we can run on this media node now. To, to allow it to actually fulfill many of the functions that are required in the broadcast chain, both on premises and interconnecting premises. Um, at the bottom there in the middle, we, there's a, you'll see a little booklet that um, myself and our head of marketing and a few others have been putting together. And uh, we've, been, we've been revising that twice yearly 
for NAB and IBC for the last four years. So I think we're up to iteration nine, I think now. So we're just updating all the time with the latest things on the industry, the standards. So that's available um, in paper, physical, but also I think we have some electronic versions of that. So if you'd like it, reach out to your sales. Um, your sales teams as well. And the badges at the bottom there are part of the Joint ta Task Force for Network Media. And it's just stuff that we've been proud to be part of to actually prove our capability is open and interoperable and works within the industry. So that's a little bit of background there. Um, I showed this picture last, last week, but this is just a little bit of a recap. Um, I, I like this diagram because it's simple, yet I think it actually describes the whole kind of ecosystem of the solutions that we, we're involved in very, very well. So we've got within those light green um, rounded rectangles, we have you know IP facilities. Um, so that's all the stuff which we've been doing roughly for the last five years. Um, about you know, IP infrastructure within a campus environment for media production. We then have the OB van, which is kind of very much very similar, but just less of it. So, you know, it, it, an OB van typically, apart from the more lightweight ones that are now coming out for true at home uh, production, typically actually have pretty well most of what you have in a facility, but um, in a mobile environment but just less of it then remote production so this is the classic you know either at home production um, remy whatever you're calling it where you are um where you typically have as we're tending towards nowadays more lightweight ob entities and then long hauling all of the individual feeds both vision audio and other stuff back to the at home gallery and production environment and then the wrap around all of it, which is where the, the, the real benefit from IP, I think, comes as we start to interconnect all of those things together is actually the concept of shared facilities and shared production or meshed production or whatever we want to call those um, federated production, where we can actually make use of both people and real estate resources like studio floors and galleries and and equipment resources, both um, physical and virtual, um, you know, and production resources so all of that stuff come together and i think that really describes the overall proposition of which you know, we're part of and i'm going to be addressing elements of that during today's um discussion and you can view some of that again as a some more detailed dive on some of that from last week as well so i talked about those benefits and um i think the the the, the, the key thing we've been observing is that you know, we're, we've gone past the ramp of early adopters of IP facilities and we're now in the kind of business as usual rollout. Now we're roughly kind of five years in since we started doing the IP facility stuff. I know some of the audio guys got there ahead of that, but I'm talking about total, you know, video and audio IP production facilities. And, and again, the benefit is the flexibility. It's not just replacing SDI with IP. It's sharing people. It's sharing real estate and it's and it's sharing equipment resources, all of that stuff and uh, some very great combinations and innovation we've seen as a result of that. And uh, I, I did use this slide as well last week. The um, just, just a few things that, are, that, that we see as, as drivers into, into what's happening. One is the increased both spatial and temporal resolutions um, that we're seeing as we move, move up. But that obviously drives a, a, re a requirement for more bandwidth. Um, so that's driving scale. The, the fact that we can just do more now means that we and the fact we're moving to an essence environment which i'll come on to later means we've got many more signals around in the world um, that we're handling and then this distributed production where we're actually sharing stuff not only within a facility but between facilities means again we have to scale for that as well so those are all kind of backdrops to the concept of the infrastructure and what i'm going to be talking about this afternoon or this morning depending on where you are on this um in this um virtualized production and just to say um the, you know the Nevion, the Nevion toolkit of solution we, we believe actually has great application not only in that campus environment not only in that outside broadcast you know long haul environment but also in the cloud environment and I'm going to come to that a little bit later on as we start to unpack some of that stuff now this is a, a picture that many of you will be familiar with it's kind of um you've probably seen it from many um many vendors by the way i've got a glass of water here my cup of tea's run out so i'll i'll go and get another one at the end of the session more on that later as well but in this in this diagram where you actually see the the move from you know traditionally where we all were with bespoke hardware dedicated pieces of hardware that do every individual function 
Um, you know, everyone, or largely speaking, most people have moved on to effectively a platform that can host different functions at different times, and if you like, generic things that can actually become different functions. We're then obviously seeing, especially in some elements already, some significant move on to, to on to software on generic IT infrastructure, especially true more in the in some of the playout stuff, but we're actually starting to do that now in in some of the actual production environment as well. And then obviously there is the question of whether that generic IT infrastructure is on-prem in, in your facility or whether it's cloud hosted. And again, we're going to talk to that a little bit later on as well. So what I want to do is to give you some context for some of the key things, the, the key changes that are happening at the moment in the industry um, from a technology perspective and some of the things we need to do as an industry in the next few months or years. Um, um, but to do that, I just want to step right back to the very beginning. Well, this is the very beginning from a UK perspective anyway. So this, this video is, um, was taken in 1932. It's Betty Bolton who has since passed away um, and she was um as you can see a few things first of all it's it's vertically scanned rather than horizontally scanned those of you may have noticed um and it, interesting very low resolution obviously as well interestingly she was in the dark so this was scanned with a single photo cell with a flying a flying dot scanner so so basically she was dark it was gradually scanning across her <coughs> with a light source and then the photo cell was being modulated by the light level and that's that that's one of the very first images that we had within in the uk that, that was transmitted but bear in mind some of those principles because we're going to come on to them and see how that's still impacting some of the way that we're actually approaching some 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 technology today so this is like unpacking so unless some of you are very young and have uh, only been alive since we've had CCD and CMOS scan sensors, sensors with um, and flat panel displays. Most of you will be familiar with the with the CRT, the, the tube where we actually have basically directing electrons and the very very clever innovations back you know almost a hundred years ago here was to actually say what we can do is we can we can scan the image so you horizontally scan uh, as was the, is the standard way now you scan across and again fly back go again and again and you build up the image and then when you get to the end you fly back and you start all over again and the reason i wanted to go back into history on this is because some of these principles are, are principles that have come with us that we're we're still living with and we're, we're you know possibly we're about to make some breaks from in the technology evolution now again for those of you that grew up with um composite analog television and video like i did and had great excitement building um um sync pulse extractors and and looking at subcarrier and stuff this is it so basically what we have here um you know, is a video signal you can see the the height the height represents the luminance and we superimpose the color using a subcarrier on top of the luminance information and then the sync pulses were to get the, the to fly back to the beginning of the next line so all of that just just bear that in mind because it's important as we just look at the journey which i'm going to quickly take you through now so we then moved on to the late 80s um, and just to give you a context of that it was the late 80s i got married so that's actually a picture of me when i had hair and weighed about two stone less on my wedding day in the late 80s um, but the excitement of that time apart from me getting married was we actually introduced sdi so suddenly we had a 270 megabit per second digital stream which could not only carry the video but we embedded all of the audio in that as um in the horizontal space and then we embedded anything else we wanted to carry time code and other ancillary data to allow us to do switching and control in the uh, vertical ancillary space so we had like what i kind of call now kind of a composite signal where everything is is, is bundled in there together but you'll notice just you know those blue zones vertically and um, horizontally are representative still of the legacy raster scan because they those are the flyback times we had to have to get back to the beginning of the picture or to get back to the top of the picture and we're making use of that space but in the sti world we actually carry all of that that, that flyback space um, and obviously have tried to utilize it as efficiently as possible 
So that serial digital interface from the late 80s then has evolved right up until very, very recently, really, the last few years. And we've gone from 270 megabits to what I never thought was going to be possible on a single piece of um, coax 12 gig SDI. Uh, so just a feat of engineering that I just really admire. So we've gone through those various formats that you'll recognize in between. Um, well, well proven, well loved, and you know people are starting to, where they're not already native IP, adopt even the 12 gig for for the um, ultra high definition. And then, as we move to the 2110 world of the stuff that's been happening, you know, in the last five years, really, so you know what we've done now is we've taken, if you like, the concept. We've gone away from the concept of that composite SDI signal where everything's being carried together because in a production environment you actually don't want everything together most of the time. The, the, the processing route for your video is very different to the processing route for your audios which is very different to the processing route for any of your metadata flows. Um, you do need to obviously be able to combine them in a timely manner at the end but actually it's much easier if the audio is just audio then you haven't got to de-embed it to actually make use of it etc etc. So this world of essence that we're introducing as we move into the IP2110 world uh, is, is important. And, and if you think about the um, equivalence here, what you see on the left there with that composite, it effectively simply ST2022-6, which we're still using a lot for, for long-haul applications, um, is basically an IP encapsulation of that whole shebang there. Um, whereas what we're doing in 2110 is we're individually encapsulating the different essences and I know I've actually the, I've dug some of these slides out just to allow me to do this recap to give you the context for where we're going so apologies if some of you have seen them already but I couldn't resist getting them out again okay so we now come to what I think is my up-to-date set of um, the, the current standards which we're using both within SMPTE 2110 and the control plane at the bottom but let me just unpack these for you just to do a little bit of revision for three or four minutes now just to remind you again it's important to have the context of this before we start looking about where we're heading in the future. So the top row there is all the fundamental transports of uncompressed video, uncompressed audio, transparent 32-bit audio for, for other things, ancillary data which is basically everything in the ANTS data space and then very importantly on the left the system definitions and on the right the timing and I'll come on to the timing in a minute so we've actually been just been almost finished going through a, like a one-year review on those it's been a bit more than one year obviously for some of those but we've actually been revisiting that top row and actually saying what have we missed what what could be nuanced what was a little bit ambiguous how can we improve on that so within Simpty that's what we've been working on the second row you see there um, is stuff that's happened more recently, but it is still vitally important. Um, compressed video, that's something, as Nerion, we've been making a lot of use of in the last year, specifically with JPEG excess compression, because once we go off campus, you know, bandwidth becomes more precious. So for national and especially international connectivity, then compressing the um, compressing the video in a, in a gentle way with JPEG XS is, in, is, is been important. And I'll come on to that uh, a bit later on where we revisit that. The uh, multi-part video dash 23 is for typically for use for slow-mo, et cetera, where we have an ultra high frame rate. So we want to carry far more data than traditionally we'd be carrying with our 50 frames a second or 59 point um, whatever for, the, for a lot of you watching um, at the moment on this seminar. Then the standard efficient video. Uh, obviously, most of the focus um, of, of what we've done in 2110 over the last handful of years has been very much on HD and UHD. Um, we, we do need to actually catch all some of the ambiguities in SD, like when does my active line really, when does my active frame really start? When, you know, how big is my actual active line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a few, a few more vagaries in, in different SD standards. Um, and this is an attempt in Dash 24 to wrap that up. Then the fast metadata um, and the and the um, FMX are very much all about conveying instantly, if you like, frame accurately, changes of information about the flow. Um, the 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 way with the control plane actually advertises information about sources updates pretty slowly with the with the system I'm going to describe in a minute. So FMX is being worked on at the moment to allow a fast update. So literally frame accurately you can actually be adapting and changing your sources. And then the dash eight there, 2022-8, is basically taking 2022-6 as it was and adding in 
the timing, the RTP timing, um, such as it is for the rest of the suite. So it can work within an ecosystem and can be actually merged and used in association with all of the essences. The bottom row there is all about the control plane, which is um, actually fairly complex in places. Um, and it, it's an important suite because this is the bit that takes us from being just, just having those data flows to be able to do hopefully you know, pretty well plug and play environment. So it's all about a device registering itself on a local registry, the local controller becoming aware of that device and then being able to utilize that, make connections to that device, to that source, um, or make connections on behalf of that recipient um, from another source. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a series of things that is growing. You'll see with several of them there already, including not to be underestimated, and I'll come back to security later, the, the security suite, the BCP003 suite. Um, I would also say, that's we haven't reached the end of the road in the control plane there's some more stuff we need to do as an industry on parameterization of of edge devices which is not covered in the scope of where we've got to though so far so um there is more work in progress in that space as well but that's a i think a reasonable quick summary of where we've got to so far there then obviously one of the key things once we've actually gone into this all ip world both for the wide area connectivity and um, our facility is you know we're leveraging it equipment and we're leveraging leveraging ip it best practice um, so what we're starting to do is we're starting to you know, take techniques of um, you know leaf spine design from data centers we're, we're taking design of, of, of how we actually architect switch fabrics. The timing stuff was already being used um, over IP by several other industries already. Um, I have to say, you know, my observation is that specifically switch vendors, um, and we work with all the switch vendors in Nevion, uh, we kind of switch vendor agnostic, um, that they all, they all have their um, sweet spots, which we, we're very pleased to use. Um, but you know those guys have really in the last five years up their game specifically on scaling for multicast scaling um for numbers of flows and and ptp support um all of those things have been things that you know we've seen massive improvement on from switch vendors over the last five years but what we're saying is all of these things are you know effectively standard it tools which we're now making use of as a broadcast industry and that leverages significant benefit for us and then a bit more context again for me to unpack a bit later on but um and many of you will have heard me talking about this a lot but you know within the um within the 2110 world and everything we've been doing up up to that point as well um udp rtp is how we've been transporting data flows so the rtp is king as i say that and that that's really important for two reasons it has two magic things it has within it uh, in that rtp header that you can see there we have a sequence number which actually allows us to determine if we've lost packets which is one of the key things we need to know about in a in the transport of ip packets and the other thing is the timestamp and we'll come on to that in a minute. But those two things are absolutely important. But just again, just so you're aware, UDP is inherently a non-handshaked fire and forget technology, which is working very well for us. You know, it's actually working as we need it for 2110. But I'm going to unpack as to why we need to look elsewhere as we move to fully virtualized infrastructure moving forward. Okay, so hold that in your mind as we step on a bit here. So I talked about the, the RTP timestamp. The great thing about that is what we're doing is we're saying we're actually using PTP timing, as, as I've alluded to uh, just a, a couple of slides ago, within our facilities. So we're able to accurately define the points we're acquiring the images, the points we're acquiring those audio, audio samples. In the audio samples are basically we tick at the sample rate, be that 48 kilohertz or be that 90, um, 96 kilohertz as we acquire those audio samples. With the video, um, we actually take a bit of a nuanced approach um, to RTP there, the RTP timestamp, because what we do is we actually freeze the timestamp at the beginning of the video frame and we actually hold that timestamp for the whole video frame. So every IP packet of the video essence that's relating to that video frame actually has the same RTP timestamp, but obviously that's incredibly important in our allowing us to actually reconcile time downstream. So again, bear those in mind because we're going to come back to that um, as we as we move forward. One of the changes which we've made in the Dash 10 revision um, 
to 2110, which has excited me, is some, some more accurate definitions to encourage people to actually honour origination time in a workflow as we go through a broadcast and um, production chain. Um, the, in the early instantiations by, I think, many vendors, to be honest, um, as we looked at the at systems that were being deployed, the, the actual origination time was being lost because each piece of equipment was putting a new timestamp which related to the point it's egressing the flow rather than honoring the original time. So what we've now got is the capability for the origin origination time. So basically, you know, frame X having timestamp N, that to be propagated through the whole system. And hopefully many vendors are going to adopt that moving forward and i'm very pleased we've been doing that in recent times on on our solutions as well and that's very important and we'll come back to that in a, as we look at our you know, compute that we're moving to shortly so just one more little bit about timing and this is all about um like how we actually generate the information that we're actually transporting and because of our what i call our raster and hardware heritage typically we've been delivering the packets that represent the video and audio in a very linear manner because typically they come from a, a camera that's producing either a serial digital output or an IP output that's, that's inherently de derived from the sensor output which is unpacked and unraveled and similarly the audio obviously per audio sample we're actually producing that so we are we have been as an industry up until this point inherently you know creating linear flows we've had some challenges within the 21 and 10 10 environment as we've actually moved to what I call synthetic sources, so com computer based server play out, because suddenly those sources aren't inherently linear and they've had to be disciplined to do so. Now, this is a slide which I used for a couple of years up until about two years ago when I abandoned it, but I brought it back just for today only. Um, this is a sped up view of airplanes arriving in an airport. I think it might be Heathrow, but I can't remember now where I got it from obviously very sped up and what you'll see air traffic control put a lot of work into spacing these planes out as they come into land because to make efficient use of the runway you need to have them nicely lined up and nicely spaced apart so they can land once every 40 seconds or whatever the the actual the prerequisite for that runway is but at the same time you can't have them coming in too close together or else really bad things happen and this has been the kind of mindset that we've had to invoke and the discipline we've had to invoke on all um, ip sources be they synthetic or or, or real sources um, in ip infrastructure um, because of the UDP RTP infrastructure, when we go into switch fabrics, all of our flows need to be linearly spaced out so we don't get clumps and bursts. Because if we have bursts of data arriving, um, then there's the risk of losing packets. And because it's not, not a handshake protocol, if we lose packets, then you know, we're actually you know, losing integrity of our video flow or audio flow or whatever it is. So this packet pacing in Dash 21 has been incredibly important the for the whole definition and we put a lot of work and had a lot of debate um, as a drafting group to, to get this to work but i'm very pleased that actually in pretty well all deployments i say there were some teething um, with some synthetic sources i think in some places but to all intents and purposes it's worked very well and this just gives you again you know from a from a frame perspective excuse me <coughs> the concept of of how this actually works with these linear frames back up now, just moving away from the, if you like, the production end to the consumption end, again, this is useful just to be think about before we move into the um, the virtualized element, is, is the change in consumption. So, you know, back when I was young, we had, I think, maybe four channels that were terrestrially delivered. Now, you know, the traditional linear stuff on the left there, you know, either delivered by cable or terrestrially or by satellite to large screens, lean back in the lounge. Um, um, but, you know, a lot of what we're delivering and consuming now is actually um, either linear that's, be, that's actually delivered via, you know, a packetized system or are actually or actually viewing on demand. Um, so, so what we're actually saying is that that linear chain of delivery, when everything is delivered fully linear through the whole broadcast chain, is actually being broken up at the consumption point as well now. So obviously, you know, typically a, a lot of, even if you're viewing um, 
you know, on an OTT delivery, you're probably getting a very bursty delivery of packets. You're, you're having clumps of packets delivered. And the only time it's actually becoming linear is actually as it's going to that, you know, D to A converter to, to go back to the video or the audio. Uh, up until that point, it's probably in very bursty, um, bursty data forms. And I think we need to be mindful of that as we actually move forward and explore some of the stuff we're gonna look at now as we get into the meat of where we're heading here. Just another just amusing slide that I've put back in. Again, I think I showed this a couple of years ago to on a couple of seminars I did, but this was the John Logie Baird competition for the um, EMI Marconi system that was um, tested by the BBC in the UK in, in 1936 for the first television um, system. And uh, the, the all electronic EMI Marconi system won, but Logie Baird system was interesting because it was a, a flying dot scanner system. It couldn't actually work on a, on a lit studio floor. The only way they could make this work, which I just think is an amazing feat of engineering, was to actually have a film, a film camera, which was then being developed in real time and going into a, to a scanner, into a telecine scanner, and converted using a flying dot scanner, converted to the electrical image to be broadcast. This actually meant there was a 42 second delay, I think, between the studio floor with the actual film camera and that film being developed and telecined to the actual emission. So when we think we've got some challenges with some of the latency we're dealing with in some of our um, stuff we're putting together in, in now in some of these digital systems, just bear in mind, people had latency issues even back over 80 years ago there. Okay, this is the meat of where I wanted to get to. So I know it's been half an hour to get here, but hopefully th that gives you a lot of context. So this is kind of my, my vision for where we are actually gonna end up in, in, in the broadcast production chain. We have on the left there, camera and obviously microphones as well, which are, are requiring real-time signals in the real world. We've got on the right hand side there, as you'll have seen from my picture that's now on TV consumption, we've got the end consumer who is consuming it on a mobile device, on a tablet, on their lean back lounge television, whatever they're consuming it on. And then the other consumption in real time of those flows is actually the multi-viewer um, and all of the, you know, the gallery production environment to do the vision mix. And obviously the audio has to be reconstructed. So the guys that do the, do the audio mix can do that. But apart from that, that whole end-to-end -end system, you know, moving forward in our environment doesn't actually have to be running linearly real time. It absolutely needs to be time aware. And that's something we're gonna come on to. We have to acknowledge and going back to those timestamps that I was talking about, that origination time information that we're tagging all of those bits of essence with, um, media essence with, that has to be honored through the process, but it doesn't need to be real time. And we'll unpack that as we go through. So what we're seeing as we move forward is, you know, we're actually, you know, virtualizing and containerizing both the, the control plane and the data plane. You know, we've been doing a lot of work on the containerization in the, in the um, control plane for several years now. Um, and now we're in, in that point of virtualizing and containerizing the various media processing functions that we're actually using as well. So just addressing one question, which I, I, I mentioned very briefly previously, is the, is the question of, is, is this compute I'm using or going to use on-prem or off-prem and, and what are the pros and cons? I, I, think, I think most of the industry recognizes there's actually a requirement to use both. Um, even by the fact that a lot of cloud providers are offering on-prem compute capability now, I think very much is actually talking to that. Yeah, what what what's the what's the what's the pros and cons? Obviously, if you have on-prem comp compute, you know, largely speaking, generally, apart from some of these new uh, models which we're seeing emerge, you know, you've got to power it, you've got to cool it, you've got to maintain it, you've got to upgrade the OS software all yourself. Um, but you can actually have very high-speed local interfacing to and from that compute um, to do what you need to, um, and it's very much under your control in the local environment. If you go off-prem, You've actually got to get the data, you've got to get your media flows there and back, which is a challenge, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. 
and then you're actually you know you're paying for the use so typically most of the models that the cloud providers have is you're charged you know on, on a per use basis or a consumption basis um, so typically you know you see people talking about maybe having on-prem compute to actually handle the baseline the baseline load of what you need to do in your production workflow and then using the cloud to flex some of those elements it may be that for some of the some of the lower bit right stuff like the playout stuff that's more 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 readily likely to be entirely cloud hosted and you, know, you actually keep some of your production environment on prem but again it depends on the maths your cfo does on the total cost of ownership of the on prem solution versus the you know the uh, opex model if you like for for the um, the cloud based solution we'll touch on that again in, uh, shortly as well so just wanted to give a little shout out for the um, some work which we're just in, in about to embark on within the video services forum. And I think there are two very important things that kind of I've been alluding to and, and will actually call out now in this diagram, which is, first of all, how we get from ground to cloud and cloud to ground. What's the best practice there? Do we need to? Um, do some form of lightweight compression, and I'll come to that a bit later on. Um, do we use 2022-7, or as we lovingly call it within Nevion SIPs, that RTP diverse, spatially diverse um, paths and merging to actually give us the, the reassurance? Do we actually use some retransmission technology as well there? All those questions for cloud to ground and ground to cloud. And then, very importantly, how do we hand data off within the cloud and that's a little bit I, I, I want to unpack um, to actually talk you through some of those discussions because that's where things start to change and become a little bit different so so that there's, there's a package of work that I'm hopefully going to be involved in, in working with which I think we're hoping to kick off literally in the next couple of weeks um, within VSF that actually is going to be addressing some of that now you heard me talking about the RDP UGP um, and how that's really worked so well for us in a linear real world data transfer of IP for all of the infrastructure and it's the it's the kingpin on which all of 2110 is is based upon the challenge is once we get into a compute environment um, it's not necessarily the best way of actually handing data off between various virtual instances let me unpack that as we go just to talk you through that before we do that there is um um, just wanted to make you aware of this. This is very timely because this has been published literally this week. It's some great work headed by Thomas Edwards from Disney in the US, um, who is a great innovator in this space. And um, he's put together quite a succinct document. I think it's less than four pages long, which actually defines what the requirements are for live cloud production. So, you know, and I think a lot of these also apply to on prem compute as well. So, um, there's lots of lots of things that need to be aware, and I'm going to unpack a few of these as we actually go through the next handful of slides here. But um, this is a well worth looking at document. If you can't find it on the AMBA website or can't find it when you Google, um, do ping me an email. I'll happily send you um, a link to this because it's um it's very timely, I say, because it's just hot off the press. So do go and check that out. Just talking about architectures of infrastructure you know we've been on a journey with video ipath which has been obviously a, a, so, a complete software solution within nevion since its inception and we've been moving both within different architectures of the clustering but also alongside that we've been moving to a, a containerized architecture and that's been absolutely vital to allow us to scale i think i was talking to you last last week in the uh, distributed and federated production seminar about you know exceeding 100,000 connections in a facility now and um and between distributed facilities T to get to that scale you know single monolithic doesn't work you have to have containerized infrastructure so that's that's the that's the direction we've been moving in back to the data plane just to unpack this so in in the just to talk you through kind of the status of where we've where we've been to so far these thick red arrows and lines if you like um in this diagram is kind of pretty well what we're doing at the moment with you know on-prem or indeed off-prem compute in the way we're handling flows because all of these all of my red arrows if you like are nice compliant linear 2110 signals which which have all the proper timing those if you remember those airplanes arriving those packets nicely spaced out and what we're doing is we're going into these separate you know typically as we move to 
you know, a concatenated virtualized end-to-end -end broadcast infrastructure. We've got various virtualized processing functions that we've got in the chain, some of which are very short functions, they're very quick functions, and some which may be like an augmented reality thing that may be, you know, significantly time consuming, but and we'll come on to the time in a minute. But each of them at the moment, we're going to painstaking lengths within the design and the architecture to go back to pristine linear spaced packets in a 2110 environment before we go into our external switch fabric and then go back again into another virtualized production, uh, virtualized processing function. Um, it works, but there's a massive overhead in doing that when we're moving to a, you know, to a, a world of compute and when we're actually getting more and more things as we move forward with it as an industry virtualized. So this is my kind of dream of where we probably get to. So we've still probably going to come in to our, you know, our production environment with a linear flow. So that could be the, you know, the output from a camera, which is likely to be still a linear flow or a microphone. Um, and obviously at the far end, it's likely as we're going to hand off to the next point at the end of our production chain that we're actually going to have that back um, as a linear flow, although maybe not in the future as either as well. But all of the bits in the middle are the important things because those are the things where we're handling handing data off between these virtual functions. Now, we don't necessarily need to go out, you know, to the to discrete external switches or not not knowingly so. And we don't necessarily, um, we re indeed we don't want to be using UDP RTP because we want to actually be doing it in in a compute efficient manner. And UDP RTP is not typically not a compute efficient manner. So what we're here is we've got two fundamental requirements. If I want to hand data from one virtual processing function to another, the two key things, it has to be done with absolute integrity and it has to be done within a, within the, within a time band. So maybe my, I, say, uh, yeah, I say to my API, I need that this datagram, which may be a video frame, part of a video frame, a bunch of audio samples, whatever, I need those to be transferred, you know, within the next five milliseconds to this next function, um, and so on. You get the drift. Um, so, and that's actually different. And the thing, uh, as consumers of this, we don't really want to be concerned with how the time-bound bit and the full integrity bit is done. That's really an under the under the lid. Um, capability which we're hoping the compute providers are going to give us. We do, however, want to define the mapping, how the 2110 maps into the, the media datagrams which we're handing. And, and going back to that video services forum work group I was mentioning, we want that to be, um, that's the kind of thing we want to get defined here is how those actual media, media datagrams look so we can have compatibility, again, between different vendors in this virtual space as well. Obviously, um, for many years, we're going to be living in a hybrid world where we've got some concatenated virtual functions on compute, and then some of them we have to break out and go, come to either physical equipment or break out to go elsewhere. So we may be breaking out to go. That could be just to a local piece of kit. It could be actually to a remote commentary that's going to be that's being done in another country um, where we've got to send them a low res video proxy and audio and then get return audio from them and return that and, and bring that back into the system. So there's lots of different things that might be happening there, but you get the idea of this concatenation and the, and the hybrid, if you like, of virtual and physical. So time management then becomes an interesting thing as we move forward with this, because we, you know, if you just think about that example with the remote commentary, that there actually might be a round trip on adding that remote commentary of, you know, 500 milliseconds to the system or even 600 milliseconds or more. Um, a lot of these other functions may be, you know, sub frame latencies or even a handful of line latencies, but we actually want to manage and orchestrate that time. So not only we are talking about orchestrating resources and connectivity we're actually talking about orchestrating time as well so that's a that's a key other thing that we're, we're we're needing to do as an industry moving forward so i'm hoping that's given you a little bit of concept as as, as to some of the stuff we need to do as an industry to get interoperability and to get leverage the best benefit of compute as we actually move forwards um, also, you know, as we move to generic compute, it's not just about CPU utilization. The reason many of us are still using what I call generic bespoke appliance-based infrastructure to actually do a lot of media processing functions is we've actually optimized that 
coalescing of FPJ, CPU and GPU resource in, in accelerator blades, which we've got, which actually do what we need to actually give us the power real estate efficiencies to actually do the processing. What we're actually now doing here, um, we're actually starting to look at leveraging standard, if you like, accelerators that are going to be used and available on cloud infrastructure as standard. You know, there's been one or two accelerators that have been available in some cloud infrastructure for several years now, but these things are growing. And I think, you know, I think there was a prediction that, you know, very soon we're actually going to have significant amounts of both GPU and CPU acceleration available in a large amount of data center infrastructure available. Coming back to security, um, just want to really just to say everything about the design principles we've been talking about today. And in fact, you know, every time we do any kind of design that's, you know, in this IP world, we actually security has to be both the first and the last thing we think about to actually make sure that both the data plane and control plane architectures that we're doing um, are fully secure end to end. And that's, you know, that's no mean thing, but the industry is really starting to, to actually consider that well now. Just talking about time on the, gla on, the, <laughs> on the ground and in the cloud and in on-prem compute as well. Um, I talked last week a little bit about timing and the importance of having you know, common timing between facilities and how that works and basically having you know, a timing infrastructure on a per facility or a per campus basis. Um, obviously, um, at, you know, as we go into this you know, compute environment and come out of it, time is important. But just to reiterate, um, my view here is that we need to actually be doing things in timely manner within the compute environment. Obviously, we need to accept things within with all of the essence timestamps so we know what moment in time every video frame, every audio sample relates to. We need to honor that as it propagates through our processing chains so that we can reconstitute it at, you know, at any point uh, with, with the appropriate timing. But really, we only need to have accurate time on the wrap to the cloud, the, the ingress and the egress to the cloud. Within that cloud environment, as long as we're time bound and we are process time aware in the way we arbitrate things, we don't need to track you know, microsecond accuracy because that's not how compute flourishes. That's not the best use of compute. So um, that's, that's another takeaway there. I alluded to the fact we've been using um, JPEG XS a lot in the last year for solutions we've been de de delivering. Um, that's a serious contender, I believe, for the ground to cloud and cloud to ground connectivity. The reason being it's sub millisecond you know, encode decode, um, which means that actually, you know, it's, by the time you've done some some you know, real connectivity over a reasonable distance, um, that, that 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 latency is negligible, um, and you know, it gives us very good quality up to you know approximately ten to one ratio, which means some of those you know ground to cloud and cloud to ground connectivity um, can actually be utilised much more efficiently if we have that kind of um, compression, and we're doing some tests with cloud providers on that at the moment. So coming back as we wrap up here, we have a few minutes for some questions. Hopefully you've got an idea of how we how that how this kind of virtual infrastructure is going to take over. It's going to radically change some elements of how we do things because as we change this timing model and we finally break free of this raster world that we've been, you know, I was going to say shackled to, but we've loved the journey <laughs> um, over the last 80 years. Um, as we do move into this virtual world, um, you know, th this, this stuff becomes very important. And hopefully you've got some concept of how this knits together alongside some of the distributed stuff we talked about last week. Um, also, don't, don't, don't forget that Nevion obviously has a great portfolio of solutions that work both in the control plane and the data plane as we, as we do this 2110 infrastructure, but also as we move forward um, to this on-prem compute and uh, to, to help get things to and from the cloud and, and, and do functions in the cloud. So do, do talk to us. We'd like to help you on your journey. So hopefully that's been of use. Um, and uh, I say, do, do come back to us with any questions. So although I'm stuck with water here at the moment, I'd like to say, um, if you're ever in the UK, my always open invitation is for you to come and, um, it's for you to come and join me for a, a cup of tea. And um, it would be great to, uh, to catch up with you and I very much look forward to having the chance to actually 